welcome to this uh, edition of EGL Live. I have with me Professor Niels Pettersen, who is a professor of public international law and European Union law at the University of Munster. And we are featuring in the next issue of EGIL 28.2 an article about customary law. Now normally when I receive an article about customary law, my eyes glaze over and I say to myself, not again. What are we going to read new about customary international law? But there certainly is something uh, new, innovative, stimulating, provocative in your article. Maybe we can start off by you explaining where did you see a lacuna in the literature that prompted you to engage in this res research that resulted in this article? The, look, I mean, when you look at the literature on customer international law, a, a lot of the literature is, is normative in nature. And then you have some literature which is descriptive, describing what the courts do. But what I didn't see in the literature is uh, first a comprehensive analysis of the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, what it's actually doing, not just what it's saying that it's doing. And second, an explanation of uh, why the court is behaving like it's behaving. And that's what I wanted to, um, to set out uh, to, to, to start with and, uh, and to, to investigate. Right. And the title of the article is The International Court of Justice and the Judicial Politics of Identifying Customary International Law. So maybe you could tell us first what are your principal empirical findings and then how do you construe them in terms of this uh, concept of judicial politics? Usually judges are a bit reticent when we talk about judicial politics. So let's first hear the principal empirical findings and then how you've conceptualized it as judicial politics. So the principal empirical findings, I made an investigation of which kind of arguments the court uses when it identifies customer international And going back how far? Going back to the beginning of the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice after the Second World War. So I didn't look at the permanent court, but I looked at all the judgments of the International Court of Justice and at all instances where the court positively identified a rule as a rule of customer international law. And then I looked... And also the cases where it denied the existence of rule of customary international law, because there are a few of these. There are a few of these, but, um, and I looked at them, but I didn't include them into the, into the systematic analysis, because I thought that uh, the confirmation is the more interesting case, because there's a higher burden of justification on the court than denying a customary rule is usually more easily done than confirming a customary um, a rule of customary um, law. And then I looked, well, did the court refer to um, international treaties as, a, um, as an argument from which it derives customary law? Does it uh, look at state practice in detail? Does it uh, maybe look at some other arguments? And the main finding is that uh, the argument it uses most is international treaties. So in almost half of the cases, it says we have an international treaty and this international treaty, usually multilateral lawmaking treaty. Either codified or crystallized or generated, one of the... Exactly. Um, international, uh, customer international law. And then the second most uh, used argument, and that was kind of surprising, um, is consent of the parties. So in almost a third of the cases, um, the court, the court um, referred to um, the, part, the, the consent of the parties and showed that both parties in general and in the abstract, that they accept this norm as a norm of, um, of, of, of customary international law. And this was seen as an argument supporting um, the rule having a status of customary international law, which is surprising from a doctrinal sense because just because two parties agree that a rule is a rule of law doesn't mean uh, that, that, it's, that, that it is indeed a rule of law because it's, it's up to the judge and not to the parties. To and decide. also to put it dramatically, 
two parties can agree that a rule is a rule of customary international law, once the ICJ said it is such, it becomes binding on everybody. Exactly. So it's... Uh, it's uh, it, uh, so you take two nice, cozy Western countries agreeing there's a rule of customary international law, and then the whole world uh, is bound by that. I'm and, just teasing. Yeah, but, but, but it, it, it becomes problematic if, if the court does it in a, in, in a judgment and, they, and, and later says, 10 years later, as, I already, um, as, as we already stated in our earlier judgment, that this principle X is a rule of customary international law, so we don't have to justify now why it is a, a rule of customary international law. Um, and then there were other um, arguments that they referred to. One argument uh, that came often was resolutions of international institutions like the UN General Assembly or the International Law Commission, uh, in, in particular the draft articles on state responsibility. Um, then precedent, so we have already stated earlier that this is a rule of customer international law, even though the interesting thing about uh, precedent is that often the court in its earlier judgment didn't um, say something on the rule as such, but uh, it used a, a similar expression as a precedent to, to go a bit further in this, in, in this later judgment. So for example, um, the court in the East Timor case referred to two earlier judgments um, saying that uh, the um, principle of self-determination of peoples is, um, has the status of an erga omnis norm, and in these earlier judgments to which it referred, it didn't refer to the customary status of, uh, the, um, of, of the principle of self-determination of peoples, but it referred to, uh, it, it referred to, um, uh, to, to um, the, the rule as part of a treaty instrument. And and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And you've talked so far little on what they do with so-called state practice. With state practice, they do very little. So um, state practice appears, well, if you see treaties as kind of paper practice, then it's, it's quite prominent, as, as I said before. But if you look at individual state practice, they almost never refer to individual state practice. Sometimes they do it in a very general way, um, state practice confirms that this is a rule of customer international law without showing us examples of the state practice, but um, that they look at multilateral practice um, and confirm a rule of customer international law never happens. So those are the principal empirical findings. Those are the principal empirical findings. But now what's interesting in the article is that you develop a certain theory or concept of judicial politics in relation to this practice. Maybe you can briefly explain this to us. So the question is what are the why why is the court doing this because from a doctrinal point of view it's very difficult to explain what the uh, what the court is actually doing. And here I looked into a certain strand, um, now more prominent strand of the literature on international courts, uh, which says that courts are institutions which uh, try to preserve their own institutional um, position and that they uh, want to, um, and, and, and that they, they, they have certain strategies to preserve this, uh, this, institution, uh, this institutional position. So they want to appear as independent arbiters of a case. They want to appear as, um, as, as a legal institution, not as a political institution. And my explanation is that um, the strategies that the court has is, is a strategy to signal impartiality and to show that it doesn't side with one of the parties, that it doesn't side with a certain group of states or with a certain um, culture, but that it uh, wants to position itself as an, um, as an impartial arbiter in a, in, in a dispute, and that these arguments help it to, um, to in this position. So now, since this is a project which, uh, at its core, it's a project of social science, a court behaving in a certain strategic way in order to achieve certain objectives and therefore position its procedure, its doctrinal understanding, its finding in the light of that, you would have, had, you would have to have some kind of benchmarks to evaluate whether it's been successful in this. 
What is your impression? Has it been successful in terms of its own objectives? I measured by reactions of the parties to the dispute, measured by reactions of the international community as a whole, there has to be some uh, verificatory mechanism to see, okay, that's the strategy, these are the, the tools, now let's evaluate whether it's obtained its objectives or not. It's, that's not, that's not what, what I did in the article. Um, yeah, so that's I can, why I'm asking it. <laughs> that's, uh, so I can only speculate on the issue. I mean, one way of measuring success is looking at the cases that come to the court. And there you see that the court is more busy at the moment um, than, it, than, it has, than it has been, for example, in the 19, uh, late 1960s and the 1970s and in the early 1980s. But what, this would should suggest that the explanatory apparatus, the strategy, the, the part you call judicial politics, would apply not only to cases where it deals with customary law, but to its general jurisprudence, because a lot of cases come which do not ride on customary law. That's, that's right. So um, the judicial politics, it does not only apply to customary law, but it, it applies generally to, um, to all kind of decisions the court takes and also on treaties. Um, I just wanted to focus on customary law in, in, in this case uh, because I thought customary law is an interesting field because it's very open to interpretation and um, so that one potential explanatory variable uh, doctrine um, is, is not, uh, doesn't interfere in, in, in a certain way because we have so many different theories of what customary international law is. Um, the court, from a doctrinal point of view, has quite, quite some leeway. And, um, and if, if, if it has leeway on the, from, from a doctrinal point of view, then the question is what are other factors that influence the court's decision making? And so that's why I used customary international law as an example to... to so, so I have another question that intrigued me when I read this. So, some years ago, I did empirical research on the appellate body of the WTO and highlighted that in a certain period, quite a long period of its existence, it in my view, somewhat obsessively, somewhat excessively, would rely on dictionaries when it came to interpreting terms in uh, the WTO uh, agreements. And then what really interested me, I tracked that the bar, the lawyers that appeared before the WTO picked up on that, and they would come into court with their briefs carrying big di dictionaries and trying to use the same method of uh, argumentation. Do, do, did you notice if there's anything similar here that the parties that go before the Court of Justice when there's a question of customary law in some way follow the cue, you're better off if you find a treaty, you're better off... Uh, is there any follow-up by the, by the litigants? I guess when it comes to treaties, yes. So that's something that, that parties have found out that, um, that, that treaties are a way of uh, showing uh, practice for um, for, cust uh, for customer international law, when it comes to consent, I don't. It, it, it's very difficult to. It's very difficult to tell. And usually, when parties consent in the abstract on a norm, that doesn't bring them any advantage in the case because they usually will uh, consent on norms uh, where they think, at least in the abstract, um, that these norms don't hurt them in, 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 in this particular case. So now for, for our readers that are interested in customary international law, and it's a very horizontal topic, so there's hardly a public international lawyer who in some way or another is not interested in customary international law. In what way would you say that in the light of your research and your article, we would need to think a little bit differently about customary international law? Can we just read this and say this was interesting and go back to sleep? Or do we need to adjust our understanding for the future of customary international law? It's, that's, that's a question that I'm asking myself when I'm teaching international law. So how do I teach students the concept of customary international law if I see that the textbook definition that we have is not what the, um, what the court is, is, is doing in practice? And my, my approach when I, when I teach the class to students is 
that I say, well, there is the textbook definition, and even if, as lawyers, if you plead before the court... You, and the text, excuse me, the textbook definition tracks Article 38... And, 38, uh, exactly. So state practice and, and opinion yours. And um, so if, if, as lawyers, you, you, you plead before the court, and uh, you, you, have to, um, you, you also have to refer to this textbook definition because that's just what's expected in, um, in, in, in the legal arena. But uh, you should also know that there are supporting arguments like treaties um, that, um, that, that, that help you to, um, to, 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 make, to make the argument stronger. Um, but as a, how, how do we think, as, uh, when it comes to scholars, how we think about um, customary international law, it's, what I'm doing is a descriptive exercise, so I don't say anything on the normative, uh, on, on the normative question, is this a good thing that the, that the court does there, or is it, or is it a bad thing? It's, 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 it's merely a description, but maybe if we think about normative um, conceptions of customary international law, we should also ask ourselves, why is the court doing this? It, would there be any other way of doing it? And, also adjust our normative concepts to, to maybe what, 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 what the court is doing. There might be, I'm just speculating, there might be some follow-up, not in terms of litigation strategy of parties, but for example in terms of the negotiation of treaty strategies, knowing that this might have the kind of impact you described in your article, they might take a different tack in the travaux préparatoires just to try and uh, leverage their position in potential future litigation. So as you, those of you who follow EJ Live know that we always select an article for an EJ Live art, uh, interview which we think is of particular interest to our readers and the status of these interviews is not to quote absolve you unquote from reading the article but a little bit like a trailer to a movie to whet your appetite to go and read the article and I'm sure that it will be a very rewarding and fruitful reading. I want to thank uh, Niels Pettersen. Thanks for writing this article and submitting it to EGIL. Thank you for your patience with our elaborate editorial process. And thank you for coming to this interview of EGIL Live. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.